glad you're joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman coming to you in Atlanta in July of 2021. Today we're going to be talking about the true story of a boy, two bears, and a fight to be free with Justin Barker, author of the book Bear Boy, as he tells his story of animal activism as a teenager in the 1990s to inspire us to stand up to protect animals from captivity and exploitation today. His story impressed Dr. Jane Goodall so much that she wrote the foreword to his book. Let me tell you about him. Justin Barker is an American animal activist, producer and author of Bear Boy, the true story of a boy, two bears and the fight to be free. He was just 13 years old when he launched Citizens Lobbying for Animals in Zoos. Known for his activism, Barker was named one of 20 teens who will change the world in Teen People magazine, and featured in National Geographic, Animal Planet, NBC, and CBS, standing up for Brutus and Ursula, two black bears living in horrific conditions in a California zoo. With his young adult genre debut, Justin hopes to delight the plight of highlight, <laughs> highlight the plight of zoo animals and inspire young people to stand up for themselves, animals, and their fellow humans. His website is bearboy.org. Parker has a degree in communications, media, arts, and productions from the University of Technology, Sydney. As a director and producer, Barker has circled the globe and crisscrossed continents directing TV shows, documentaries, and producing online education series. He's a Sacramento native and now lives in San Francisco with a rescue dog, Beatrice, his son, Noah, and partner, Bridget, who both identify as queer. Welcome, Justin. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me, Carrie. Well, tell us about your first encounter with the bears, Ursula and Brutus in the zoo in the 1990s when you were just a kid, like, and, and, you know, what you thought and, and how you reacted. Sure. You know, so I had started an animal rights organization, like you said, Citizens Lobbying for Animals in Zoos. And one day I got a letter from a woman who said there's these two bears living in terrible conditions in um, a small cage um, next to a creek that floods every year. And I, uh, you know, I, I wasn't driving yet. So I was like, hey, dad, we, you know, can we drive me uh, to see the bears? And I had been working to stand up for zoo animals, uh, and when I got to this um, little corner of a city park, um, I was really horrified by what I saw. You know, Brutus and Ursula uh, were two black bears, siblings, who um, had spent, when I originally uh, met them, had spent like, you know, about 18 years in, in this cage. Yeah. And the cage was terrible. It was, you know, it was not much bigger than a shipping container. And uh, and it didn't take long as you kind of just, if you had any, <laughs> any, um, you know, uh, sense for animal welfare or care for animals to, to see that this was not okay. Uh, Ursula had like, both of the bears had paced uh, on the so so much around the perimeter of inside of their cage that um, they had worn a path in the concrete, mm. and uh, the the floors were covered in this like thick algae, so they could hardly stand properly, and uh, and they weren't being fed properly. It was it was really bad, and. Then to add insult to injury, uh, they were on a creek that flooded almost every winter. Uh, um, so they'd, oh, they'd have to be tranquilized and relocated to a smaller cage. Um, so it was really a really bad, bad conditions. And what zoo was this? Well, you know, it was called Royer Park Zoo, yeah. um, and uh, it was a tiny, it was a tiny zoo that um, kind of had, you know. There used to be a bunch of animals, uh, but over the years, the animals were literally washed away in floods, um, and oh. the bears were the only ones that had survived, and uh, pretty pretty disgusting. Yeah, and so, and I'm going to back up a little bit, and so even before you were so upset and disgusted about these particular bears, as a teenager, you started a, kind of an anti-zoo <laughs> group like how did you know to start that or why did you pick that issue well you know i talk about this in the book uh but 
I found a book about animal rights at a used bookstore. <laughs> and, uh, and it, it's, and, you know, it's partly why I wrote the bear boy was because I really, you know, a book about animal rights and about activism changed my life, completely changed the direction of my life. Um, so I really wanted to, to write a book and, and pay that forward. But this book was actually, you know, the one that I found when I was 13 years old, uh, was written by, um, Ingrid Newkirk. I, knew you, I just knew you were going to say that because there were just so <laughs> few books if it wasn't like a Peterson singers or uh right you know, tom reagan's kind of animal rights philosophy book it was going to be an ingrid newkirk book yeah ingrid ingrid wrote this book for young people and it was a simple book but it was really profound it was a profound book it helped me realize that i was eating animals by eating meat um i went vegetarian when i discovered that and never wow. never eaten meat i'm vegan now or never ate meat again but when i got to the chapter about zoo animals something really pulled um right. at my emotions and heartstrings about the state of of animals and zoos and uh went from being a real struggling teenager to um, one who absolutely had a mission. And part of that mission was, I told my dad, I was like, hey, dad, I want you to take me to the Sacramento Zoo every single day during the summer. Um, and I'd go in with my, with my little notepad to investigate what was happening there. Wow. And it was amazing because just showing up every day at the Sacramento Zoo, I started to talk to zookeepers who started feeding me information about the, you know, what was really going on at the zoo. Wow. And all of that information ended up leading to uh, the American Zoo Association tabling their accreditation, um, this massive investigation um, from the local newspaper, the Sacramento Bee came out and said, you know, basically with the information that I had shared with an animal rights organization who then shared it to the bee, um, you know, was accused of like animal neglect. Wow. Uh, so it was amazing to just like you know, how a book led to me really doing some investigations and how those just searching out for knowledge um, and networking um, led to some big changes at the Sacramento Zoo. Uh, and uh, and, and this... to your dad, too, for like driving you. Listen up, parents. <laughs> he drove you to the zoo all the time. And for you to spend your summer doing that, like doing the work that it takes to research something on behalf of animals to build a case you know right for them and like and the um the bears like how did you what work did you do to actually rescue ursula and brutus um the ones that we were describing earlier or that were in that small cage that ended up flooding a lot of course so you know brutus and ursula the first thing i saw you know when i was there was I asked one of the keepers who just was a maintenance guy. Uh, I was like, hey, what, what are you feeding the bears? And he's like, it's monkey chow. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah. do you ever feed them anything else? And um, and he's like, no, we just throw the monkey chow in oh, through yeah. this little no slot fresh, over here. For, no like mm. fresh berries or anything? Nothing. That's nothing terrible. yeah yeah so that was my first step was you know the very first um thing i did was insist that they change their diet okay. um because that just felt like a baseline like yeah. you shouldn't be feeding bears monkey chow and they need fish and you know and you know ba berries and fruit once in a while yeah. like they Fresh need a mixed food. diet you know so that was what started it and then how you know I ended up getting the mayor of the city's home phone number um, <laughs> and he, cause it was a small town and they were like, Oh yeah, he, he works from home. So just here's his phone number. And he was very unresponsive. He basically laughed at me when I first called. Um, and the, the city just was unresponsive mm -hmm. to my requests and I got the media involved. Uh, the, there was an article that came out and ended up on the front page of the local paper there about what I was trying to do to help their their diet. And I quickly realized that, whoa, this city is not going to, you know, the mayor told me at some point those bears were born in that cage and they're going to die there. Uh. I was literally told me that. <laughs> and I, I hope he was voted out of office. Well, you know, that was, you know, not to sidetrack you, but like, no, <laughs> I just mean, am mad about that. That turned into my rallying call, honestly. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, 
as much I wanted to free the bears to get them into the to a better condition. That was like the 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 main goal. But I also wanted to prove him wrong as a young right. person. And uh, and that's, you know, it turned into a three year long campaign. Uh, the city was very hesitant to, like, let the bears go. Yeah. Um, but eventually they agreed if I could find them a new home, that they would let the bear, they'd let the bears be relocated. Okay. Uh, so then I ended up finding a sanctuary, a Folsom Zoo sanctuary that was only like 30 miles from the zoo right. who agreed to take the bears and then. The rest is history. But it cost a lot of money to do that, I heard. Like a quarter million dollars. A quarter million dollars. That would normally said... stop most of us. Like we'd be like, <laughs> oh shoot. But was it were you how were you able to as a teenager to garner so much attention to raise a quarter million dollars to relocate them? You know, it was really a media uh, campaign that I yeah. that I leaned on. And you know, as a young person. The media, you know, the originally the the local media really loved the story, uh, and that um, and that kind of started the thing. We we established a fund where people can send money, and then yeah. money started pouring in. Um, and as it does, the more media, um, you know, the more media got involved, national media got involved, and you know, every time I was on a national TV show talking about the plight of the bears um and really talking about how terrible captivity was i thousands of dollars would flood in and uh and that's really over time that's you know how the money was raised and and then it was really pressure you know that there, there was some some pressure tactics to actually get the city who kept the bears to fork over money and uh so it was a mix of that of just like local donations from all over the world um coming into to to the fund to help the bears and then also just the when you know the every leverage single... of the media coverage was important right and you find that Massive. out as an activist a lot like when you try to ask like you did as a just a reasonable young person like oh hey let's do something about this and you get told no or ignored then you're like well okay i gotta take it up a notch and then you get the media involved and that you know gives um ordinary people more um more power now Indeed. tell us where brutus and ursula are now were you able to get them to that sanctuary well, Brutus and Ursula are now long um, gone. Uh, it was, it was, this it, was, we're talking about something from the 1990s. Yeah, so they um, they are definitely in a place where there are no cages anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how long did they uh, get and, to you know, live at the sanctuary? The, you know, they lived there about like uh, four and five years. Okay, so um, they kind of retired. They spent their retirement there. So which was it's a it's a kind of a happy ending for them that they got to experience something nice before they died. Absolutely. And what was amazing was, you know, after spending years living on concrete, their bodies had really broken down. Ugh, yeah. um, and luckily, because they were relocated and, and in a place that had, you know, keepers who just like, really put animals first yeah. um ursula you know had a, a weekly massage therapist Aww. and an acupuncturist to help with her you know the the issues with her with her um her discs uh, and pain. her she had a, yeah and help yeah bombs. yeah wow. and you know they were both able to they had a a warm spa you know a, a big enough for both of them to fit yeah. into it was and so they were, it, it was truly retirement. Yeah. And, um, and luckily today, the, the place where they lived um, is still home to um, bears, rescued bears. Uh, so the- oh, That's um, awesome. What's it called again? It's called Folsom Zoo Sanctuary. Folsom Zoo Sanctuary. That's awesome. And have you remained involved in promoting animal rights to liberate other animals from the captivity industry? You know, I still work, you know, right, I'm really in a moment right now trying to get uh, documents released from the, the San Francisco Zoo. I'm here in San Francisco, and um, it's one of the worst zoos in the country. Um, oh, and oddly, odd, the yeah, most odd. progressive yeah. cities on, you know, here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's really bad. This zoo has a very long history um, from, uh, I mean, it's, you know, within... 
the last 10 years, it's shocking what's happened there. Um, and uh, the, the um, management is just terrible. And essentially, you know, I think as, as I kind of shared, what I started with was my research um, right. to really uncover what's happening at a zoo. And I'm doing the same here at okay. the San Francisco Zoo. I spent the last two years requesting documents um, and the zoo has just straight up refused. And, mm -hmm. um, and luckily here in San Francisco, there is a, um, there's a like pseudo judicial body um, called the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force that ensures that um, there's like transparency in Good. records. Uh, and they just a few months ago found that the San Francisco Zoo is in violation of city and state oh, laws nice. and also in violation of their lease agreement because they refused to release information to me. Um, so it's taken two years to get to that point. So this, wow. these things take time, um, but that's where I'm at right now is really uh, trying to better understand the state of um, my local zoo yeah. uh, because that's the best thing we can do as right. activists and people who care about animals. Like there's so many zoos in the country. Um, yes. Why not focus on your local one to really hold them accountable? Right. If you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature, and I'm host Carrie Freeman talking about the new book, Bear Boy, with author and activist Justin Barker. The website is bearboy.org. Justin, how does your identity as a queer person feature in this coming of age teen activism story? You know, I really struggled um, as a young person, um, a sensitive person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I this this book is essentially about how um, standing up for the bears helped me stand up for myself. Uh, yeah. And, it, you know, I explore coming out to my family in this book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also explore like how um, sexuality, you know, I came out as gay when I was uh, when I was 15 um, and, and, and talk about that in the book. Uh, yeah. But then, you know, over time, I've learned that actually I'm queer and that I can be attracted to all sorts of, of genders. I'm married to a woman and, and happily married. Uh, uh, with a son. And so, um, so part of this story is also about how um, sexuality um, is fluid and changes um, over time. Uh, so that's, that's definitely explored in the book. Right. And, that, and I think that's great for all of us to be thinking about and to identify with you and just this process of knowing yourself as an activist, um, as a person. That's great. Well, and Thank Justin, you. for listeners who are interested in helping particular animals in their communities, like at local zoos that, that you mentioned earlier, what, did, what advice do you have for them to get started? I mean, I think the first thing to do is just show up and bear witness. Okay. Uh, I think that especially um, in the zoo, you know, it's easy to just show up, which is a unique part of, you know, the zoos are like open to the public, which, you know, if we're thinking about like, you know, the animal rights um, world. <laughs> it's easier like you than a just... research lab or a farm. Exactly. You can't just show up to your, uh, your local factory farm or your research <laughs> lab. So, but you can show up to your local zoo and there's just some baseline things that, you know, that you can observe uh, and, and realize, oh, there's something going on here that there, that, that change needs to happen. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it doesn't take much to see a pacing animal or, you know, yeah. concrete, only concrete enclosures or just, you know, animals that just, it's easy to witness an animal not being happy if you're being observant um, right. and, and have some baseline things. So, so I think that's the first step is like showing up and, and, and invest, you know, and you using can, your eyes you, and your intuition. Yeah, use your phone to also do small videos to prove to people what you're talking about. And yeah, then, I think you know, that's the like, conditions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the first step, but then, you know, really investigating, like understanding, like, who owns the zoo, your local zoo, um, what the structure looks like. You know, the, I learned pretty quickly here in San Francisco that the city um, of San Francisco owns all of the animals, owns the land, mm. but has outsourced management. 
Um, so even just like understanding what the management structure looks like, because once you have an understanding of what these structures are, then you have some sense of um, a, where you can hold yeah. a, an organization like this accountable. Uh, so, so that's kind of like the baseline is show up, um, understand the structures and then figure out like where there's levers to hold these, uh, these, um, these organizations accountable and uh, and that's where I'm at I'm at, you know I did it years ago and yeah. now I'm like oh wow there are like the the management will be and can be held accountable because at the end of the day the elected officials are the ones who sign the the you know millions of dollars over to this this zoo every year um so that's the first step uh, really those are the first few steps um and and then leveraging media i think right. um the one thing i really um would encourage is that as activists if you're interested in you know creating change in the world i think the baseline thing to do is support your local media you know to like subscribe to your newspaper ah. because um, you know, make sure that we have um, that the accountability, you know, if nothing, if if nothing happens, at, you know, in a government, you know, through your local government, then, you know, the media is often the, the place to turn to um, when change isn't happening at like all or as quick as you state, as they call it. Yes, exactly. And so supporting local radio, supporting <laughs> your your local newspaper, like these things, these without, you know, journalists and without um, local and independent media, um, the future of activism does not look great. And um, and so that's like I one agree. thing that I really try to advocate for is like understanding how important journalism is for change. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's what this, this, this story is about the bears and saving the bears, but this is also, this story is like a love letter to journalists and media and how that they ultimately um, shine the light on uh, in dark places. That's awesome. And nobody uh, here at our station, Radio Free Georgia, is going to disagree with you. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Well, that is the end of our show. But I want to thank you, Justin Barker, for being with us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. And I hope that by sharing your story in Bear Boy that everyone, especially young people, is inspired to stand up and protect anyone in need, human or non-human. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcast every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com backslash into nature, in tune to nature. The views and opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board, staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman, asking you to please support independent non-commercial media, just like Justin was talking about, uh, like Radio Free Georgia here or in your local community. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species. Thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs>